Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. The invention caused outrage. People regarded the new technology as the moral downfall of society, and as you might imagine, made it a hot topic for conversation. Doctors warned the apparatus had catastrophic events for women and girls. Women, you see, were thought to be frail. Referred to as the angel of the household, their jobs were to keep house and raise children, and nothing more. The new device was too hard on their dainty feminine skeletons, Their feet would become deformed, forcing them to walk in an odd, non-feminine plunging motion. The bones in their fingers would curl into a claw. Even their facial features weren't immune. Their mouths would contort into a grimace, and their eyes would bulge from their sockets. With continued use, a woman's body would become more masculine, that is, if she even survived at all. Doctors told the public that a woman's reproductive system severely limited her from doing anything more manly, and this contraption might cause her finite femininity and energy to become permanently extinguished. Doctors also said the new technology would render women and young girls sterile. Entire medical journals detailed all sorts of anomalies linked to the invention. Women were likely to suffer appendicitis attacks or even ruptures. Inflammation, overexertion, and dangerous internal swelling of the throat, just to name a few. It was said that the device took a toll on their looks, too. Women risked dark shadows under their eyes, pale lips, clenched jaws, and an overall look of weariness. Heart palpitations, insomnia, headaches, and even depression were known side effects plaguing women. Some doctors stated the conditions were permanent, while others thought that with enough time away from the invention, a full recovery could be expected. To society's horror, women using the machine also began to dress differently, wearing bloomers instead of dresses. Until now, women hadn't even shown their ankles. Pastors and others warned the apparatus might loosen women's morals. Women might even be deriving, dare I say it, pleasure from the invention without a man. In 1891, a Sunday Herald reporter wrote that seeing a woman with the device was the most vicious thing he had ever laid eyes on, far outweighing women's smoking. Three years later, in 1894, the New York Times headline read, Lunacy in England. The article stated that, without a doubt, persistent use led to weakness of the mind, general lunacy, and homicidal mania in women. Unable to handle the technology, women reportedly became overly exhilarated, and the stress, both physical and mental, would cause them to harm others while using the contraption and leave innocent people for dead. While this invention sounds pretty awful, men were completely unaffected. In fact, they were encouraged to utilize the same apparatus. The invention was all the rage back in the 1890s and benefited men greatly, both for business and for pleasure. There were even special clubs for men who owned them. All over the country, new cultures surrounded the device. The message was clear. The invention was purely masculine, and only men could handle such a contraption. But the real reason ran a bit deeper. A woman doctor, a rarity for the time, disagreed with her male counterparts. She pointed out that not one doctor could produce evidence suggesting that the side effects they described were real. No one walked around with claw-shaped hands, plunging walks, or the horrendous face that had garnered a diagnosis at all. It's quite the visual. The women of the day didn't buy it, either. Women everywhere used them. Susan B. Anthony even said that equal rights were closely tied to this invention. A paper in Pennsylvania pointed out that the new technology had given women the ability to go to the store, visit a friend, and exercise, all without waiting for a man to take her places. And that had been the real issue all along. It allowed women a level of freedom that most men of the time found threatening. Today, it's hard to believe that one simple object caused moral panic. And the invention? The bicycle. (music) 
All across Europe, it stood for manliness. Those with them were viewed as more elite than those who did not have them. In Germany, only men who had proved themselves in battle were permitted to wear them. They became the symbol for bravery and dashing courage. And by the 19th century, they became all the vogue for society's elites. So waiters, domestic servants, and priests were forbidden to have them. Men wearing them were considered more handsome, more virile, and certainly more important. In France, this fashion trend happened at about the same time that fine restaurants catering to the rich began to open in Paris. Like plenty of cultures, dining is often more than just about the food, though. For the wealthy and elite in France, it was also about showing off their importance. The clientele wanted an experience, and that meant they wanted to feel superior over those who served them. And so, the waiters were banned from wearing them. Those who insisted were fired. The men who were denied the ability to wear the fashion felt humiliated, demoralized, and emasculated. Women during the Industrial Revolution often claimed that a man without one wasn't a suitable man at all. Although the waiters complained, restaurant owners turned a deaf ear. If the ultra-wealthy wanted to flaunt their manliness and superiority over them, so be it. Though the industry wasn't the same as a factory, there were unions, just not as tightly formed. Waiters came and waiters went, although it said that thousands went on strike. The newspaper reported that this wasn't so much about the style as class, and that in another 10 years or so, another class difference would be the center of attention instead. The reporters stated that the waiters, if their demands were met, would then ask for better pay and all sorts of other things. Sooner or later, prices would go up, and it would be the patrons who would strike instead. In America, the New York Times jumped into the fray, stating that preventing waiters from wearing them was like the days of slavery. Such acts were not becoming of the French elite. It was, the reporter wrote, a grotesque and humiliating display of tyranny. The cause became known as the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. When the movement reached Parliament, Antide Boyer, the socialist deputy from Marseille, proposed a bill to make bans illegal, enforceable by serving three months in prison. The restaurant owners lamented their elite clientele might go elsewhere. They paid to feel like they were being served by lower-class people, not equals. During the strike, though, waiters heckled the scabs who had been hired to take their place and picketed outside of the restaurants. The police were called in to arrest the strikers, although they also ended up arresting Americans who had come to dine and had no idea that lacking the trendy sense of style got them lumped in with the strikers. The Boyer Bill failed, but all was not lost. By early May, waiters across the city had finally won the right to sport this elite style of the rich. Proponents argued that the waiters should have asked for better pay, more time off, and better working conditions as well. The men all replied that it had nothing to do with socialism or capitalism, and everything to do with the sense of belonging and self-identification. France had finally confronted the injustice that had been brewing right under everyone's nose. And when the restaurants reopened, waiters proudly returned to their jobs, sporting the thing they had fought so hard to wear. A mustache. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.